joining a small group puts you in a group of like-minded people with the same passion where you're able to build relationships. I'm into sports, I'm into camping, I'm into hiking, I'm into cars. So those are all the small groups that I've done. It's all about creating relationships and community. It wasn't just about reading the Bible. We, we were interacting with each other, we talked. We laugh, we had fun. This group of guys that I've met in small groups inside the church have become some of my closest friends. I was able to pull from people that have already been through my stage of life and be able to know that I have someone that can give me guidance or even just prayer anytime I need it on that personal level. We're there to make each other better and sharpen each other. You are gonna build great relationships, you're gonna grow in your faith, you're gonna come closer to God, and you're gonna build those relationships with godly people around you that share your values. So I couldn't encourage you enough. Please join a small group, you won't regret it. All right, all right. Well, welcome, Victory Family Church. Good to be together today. I'm Pastor Sean Moore. My wife, Sarah, and I are campus pastors up in Meadville. Speaking of which, welcome, Meadville. Welcome, Newcastle campuses online. Can we welcome our whole church family? One church, multiple locations, and fact, even people join us all around the world, even. You guys are a blessing as well. And it's such a joy to be with you today. I just want to take a moment to honor our lead pastors and founding pastors, Pastor John and Pastor Michelle, which Miss Michelle is here today. Can we just honor them? We're so thankful for you guys, your obedience, your blessing. And, you know, it is so important that, and that we're grateful for the things that God has entrusted to us, the things he's gifted us, whether just in your own personal life, but certainly us together as a church family. And we are so, so blessed. And we should thank God that we're under the leadership that he has positioned us uh, here as a part of, of Victory. And uh, last week, Pastor John actually kicked us off with a few weeks talking around small groups and relationships and the things that God wants to do in our lives and, and through us in that context. And he started off by talking about growth and growth in that context of small groups. And this week we're going to talk about connection. Next week, Pastor John will be back and he'll be bringing the word as it relates to care in the context of small groups and those relationships. And, and so I'm excited to dive into this today. And if you're taking notes, I encourage you to do so as an act of valuing the things that God wants to speak to you. And that's every single week. That is what we are expecting. We're not expecting a good talk. We're not expecting like we're going to like a TED talk or finding YouTube content or just a general life encouragement. We're expecting to hear from God to impart things to us that we can apply in our everyday lives that changes things. It changes us and the world around us. And with that expectation, I encourage you to take notes. And if you're doing so, I encourage you to write down our starting reference from the Bible that we're going to dive into that really frames the entirety of these three weeks, and it's in Acts chapter 2. Acts 2, verses 46 and 47. Acts 2, 46 and 47 says, and this is just for context, this is right after really the birth of the church, which we are continuing fruit of, but it began where 3,000 people were added, were saved, gave their lives to Jesus, day one, mega church in one day. And right after this, it says, this is verse 46, it says, day by day, this is what they did, they were attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. And again, if you're taking notes and you want to title them, you can title it Surrounded or Connected. Surrounded or Connected. Let me pray over us as we dive in. Father, we thank you so much for the honor of your presence. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who you you've given to us as our teacher. We ask you to teach us, show us truth, open up our eyes, help us to see what we need to see so that we can walk in what you've graced us to walk in. I thank you for that over us all today. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Amen. I want to take us back a month to simpler times, you know, a whole month ago. But a month ago, if you remember, there was this thing called Christmas 
And then I just love Christmas time of, of year. And personally, one of the things that I so enjoy about Christmas is watching Christmas movies. Can I get an amen? I don't care if it's a most like kids movie, adult, like what, whatever it is. And you might be like, well, Pastor Sean, where do you stand on Die Hard? Is it a Christmas movie or not a Christmas movie? And I will say, I will raise you that Lord of the Rings, all three movies are Christmas movies. Come on. I'm just, I'm just feeling the anointing. I had to go with it. I had to go there. Just look at when they were re- released. If you don't know when they came out in theaters, so just, just some, some history for you. But, but, but Christmas movies, of course, one of those uh, is the classic Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, right? And with this, you didn't expect to hear about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer today, but, that's, but we're going there together. And I think there's so much parallel here. There's a part, of course, now if you don't know Rudolph, I don't know what to say to you, but, but there's a moment in, in there where Rudolph and Hermie and Yukon Cornelius, all these guys, they're, they're, they're going to this island of misfit toys. Anybody remember that part of, of the movie, right? So they're on, they get to this island, they discover it, the island of misfit toys. They don't know where they are. The toys sing them a song that you're on the island of misfit toys, and now it all makes sense. Okay, thanks for singing to us. And so they uh, interact with them. They find out these are toys that have basically been uh, discarded, neglected. Basically, kids don't want to play with these toys, right? They have different things about them, ranging to all kinds of funny and interesting things. Everything from a train that has square wheels on the caboose to uh, there's a cowboy that rides an ostrich, which I still think is kind of cool. I don't know why a kid wouldn't want that. Uh, but, and, and then, of course, there's the Jack in the Box, whose name is actually Charlie. And who wants to play with a Charlie in a box, right? And he's... It's rough. It's rough, Charlie, right? Uh, but I think it's, it's so interesting uh, because I think you see so many parallels where so many people are generally within the world and specifically even within the church. Because these toys are stuck on an island of disconnection. They want to be connected to a child. They want to have that relationship, but they're stuck on an island, and, and many people today, and perhaps this is where you would feel or maybe not even recognize it, but by the end of this time, you might discover, man, I'm on an island. You might be on an island of no connection, like these toys are on the island of misfit toys. And you might be on an island of a bad connection where you've been in relationships or connected to things that you know are destructive and maybe because of it, very judgmental or critical or make you feel less than. Or maybe you're on a different island where there's, it seemed like it was a good connection, but actually, by the time you get to the end of it, it actually leaves you worse than where you started. Things like habits and addictions or even certain relationships where it's, <clears throat> it's a false connection. Or, but the place that God wants to move us to, particularly as a body, is to that place of true connection with him. <clears throat> But we can fall into the, some of the same patterns of these toys where they were surrounded by each other, but yet they still felt disconnected. And they had perfectly valid reasons for why they were stuck in their disconnection. And I wonder what reasons you and I might have for where we are today in that map. That we might be in a place of denial, which to be candid with you, I can sometimes fall into this trap where with this lie that, you know, I don't know if I really need that like other people need that. We have this denial of our need to connect in a greater way with others. You know, that's kind of for other people. Or maybe it has to come down to your personality. And you say, yeah, great, but, you know, that's not my Enneagram number. Right? I mean, that's not really my personality profile. That's for the extroverts. Right, I want to go just sit at home, be by myself. Uh, or maybe you fall into the trap of, of, of fear and you're just paralyzed. And you reject yourself by saying, I'm just so awkward. If I, I try to talk and, whatever, and I just mess it up and I don't say the right things and I kind of push people away. Or, or what if they don't accept me? I, I'm just not going to fit in. We can let fear trap us. We can also let our past experiences trap us. Excuse me. Wow. I get some water. Thank you. That wasn't a burp. Just, just so you know. It's like a deep drop. It's like I, I just like second puberty or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's odd. We'll look into that later. But 
<clears throat> but maybe it's our past experiences. We've just been hurt, and quite frankly, we don't want to put our heart on the line again. Or we've been offended, and you know what, that's it. And people separated themselves from church, separated themselves from God's people, all because of hurt. And there's the whole church hurt thing, and there's real hurt. But sometimes I wonder, was it really, was it, because the way that sometimes we act, it, it actually was a hurt, but it became harm. Because of how we process hurt. And this is bonus content for, for a moment. But do you understand there's a difference between being hurt, which, to be honest with you, is inevitable around imperfect people. Some point in time, you're going to get hurt at Victory Family Church. You just received that word today. Thank you, Lord, for the hurt. No, not intentionally, but it's, but it's just going it's just, it's just to happen. Hurt's going to happen, but hurt is different than harm. Doctors hurt you, but they're not trying to harm you, right? They're trying to do surgery, they're trying to do some things, and they try to mitigate the pain as much as they can. But the reality is there's necessary pain sometimes to grow. Sometimes there's necessary pain that we need to move forward. And it's not easy, it doesn't feel good, it's not comfortable, but, but sometimes that hurt can become harm with how we process it, and it becomes bitterness, becomes offense, and now we're disconnected. Our past experience can get us. And time can get us. I'm too busy for that. Who Ain't nobody got time for that. I got places to go, people to see, season of life, and there's, there's truth to those realities, but we can let time be a reason that we stay isolated, disconnected, and then lastly, it could be a super spirituality that we can fall into. All I need is God and me. Just me and God, me and my Bible, me and nature. That's, that's, just, that's just all that I need to really connect with God, and, and then I'm good. The problem with that is the Bible and God himself, who said it's not good that man be alone. And he said that, by the way, this is Genesis chapter 2, after he made humanity, made creation, everything is perfect, has this man, I mean, everything is great, perfect relationship, no sin, no death, just me and God is perfect. It's better than it is for you and me with him right now. Like this is complete walking in the cool of the day, walking and talking. This is a level of relationship and fellowship that we haven't even experienced yet. He has that with God. And God said, still not good. Still not enough. Wouldn't you have feedback for God if you're Adam? Like, I don't know, it's pretty good. Especially if you had a context for where, where we are and the things that we experience today in a fallen world. But God said, still not good. Why? Because you're alone. I'm going to make a helper, a partner together with you. You need relationship with not just me, but with somebody else, another person. You need that connection. And so today I want to see in Acts chapter 2, verses 46 and through 47, that God wants to lead us into that place of connection. And we're talking about small groups because that's the primary way we we practice this, but I want you to understand that small groups is not a program of the church. It's not just a nice church idea, a modern invention, or, or whatever. It's actually what was practiced from the very birth of the church. It's a God idea, an organic idea, and we need it. And, and we see in verse 46, it says that they attended the temple together. That's what we're doing right now. It's the large group gathering where we worship. We get the teaching of the word. We experience the work of the Holy Spirit it together, and there's things that are only going to happen, by the way, in that setting. You're not going to get it with just you and God. You're not even going to get it necessarily in the fullness in a small group context. It's only going to happen in the large group gathering of the church. There's things that you only get, and part of that is we receive from the gifts that that the, that the word of God mentions in Ephesians chapter 4. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. He appointed them for the building up of the church. The equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry. And the large group gathering positions us to receive from that gift. We need it. And that's a God idea, not an authoritarian, organized religion idea. He established that structure. He established that that authority not to be lorded over, but to serve and equip and empower. And that's part of what we're doing right now. By the grace of God, we're all looking to him to speak to us. But we also need the other. They didn't just attend the temple together. It says and. Can you say and? So it's not just weekend services. It's not just the Sunday gathering, so to speak. It's not just the large. It says and. 
and they were breaking bread in their homes. Verse 47, they were praising God and they were having favor with all the people. It's the large and the small. It's sitting in rows together, shoulder to shoulder, as well as sitting in a circle face to face. We need both. We need the rows and circles. We need the, the shoulders and the heart to heart, face to face. We, we, we need that. And it's not just a program. It was actually, it's actually because of the very lifestyle of walking with God. And the world needs to see a connected, loving, committed community because Jesus said when they see your love for one another, they'll know. They're, they're the disciples of Jesus. I see evidence of a real and living God that I can't see with my eyes, but I see that. And it's attractive and it testifies. It's more than just we have relational needs, so we got to go hang out together. That's part of it, but it's bigger than that. It's actually bigger than just you and me feeling connected. It's that it points, as I just said, it points to the reality of a living and loving God. And that's what's at stake, that we take the step into connection. I love this illustration of the giant sequoia trees and the redwoods. I mean, they're the largest and tallest trees on the planet. Amazing. But one of the most amazing things about them is the root systems that they have. And, you, and actually, the roots, you might think in your mind, I would imagine that the roots are just crazy deep in the ground because to support that height, it's just nuts. And just their size. But the reality is their roots, relative to their size, they actually aren't as deep as you might assume. And yes, their the roots go deep. They do go down into the ground. But, but the bigger thing is that they go out. And they go out not just to go wide, but they go wide. And then they actually connect to other clusters of trees. Because these types of trees, they actually grow in communities. And their roots go together and they actually intertwine together and they draw strength from one another. But it's even more than that. They'll share resources with each other. They'll communicate to each other. Talking trees, baby. Look out. In fact, it's said that whenever there are times of drought, that the older trees more established will forego some of their resources and redirect them to some of the younger saplings that their roots are connected to. And in the same way as the body of Christ, Colossians 2 says that our roots go down into Christ. Let your roots go down. He's, he's our first connection because he first connected with us, giving his son and raising him to life. Giving, our roots go down into Christ first. Without that, there's nothing to give. But then they go out to others. We need both root systems established in our lives because we're his body and we're connected. And I want to lead us now to spend the rest of our time to give us four big ideas related to this. And these all come out of the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And we're going to look at verses 9 through 12. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. These four verses give us for, if you will, benefits, mutual benefits of when we walk connected. And the heart behind this is that you would see the value, that we would be inspired and, and realize, man, I, I've got to be a part of this. There's a plan and a purpose. God wants these things for my life. And if I'm not walking in that place of true connection with God but also his people, I'm missing out on these four things that God longs for you and for me to experience in our everyday lives. And I'm taking these from out of a commentary for Dr. Warren Wearsby, I believe is how you pronounce his last name. These four words that he uses to summarize these things as a framework for us. And the first one is Ecclesiastes 4, verse 9. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 9, it says, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. They have a good return for their labor. If you're taking notes, the first big idea is work. Work. They have a good return for their labor. We just 
work better together. We're more productive when we work together. Another place in scripture says one could put a thousand to flight, but two could put 10,000 to flight. There's just more productivity when we work together. And it could be something very practical, like helping somebody move into their new home. It could be spiritual, helping somebody grow in God. It could be relational and navigating life or with your family, with your spouse, with your job, pursuing the goals and dreams and things that God has placed in your heart. There's acceleration there's multiplication. There's just more that gets done when we're working together on something. And I love this picture and illustration of these Belgian draft horses. And what's so amazing about these horses, first of all, they're just, they're basically the strongest horses on the planet. And they're, they're used to, to uh, pull heavy, heavy, heavy loads. In fact, a single Belgian draft horse can pull up to 8,000 pounds. I mean, he's out towing your truck, okay? 8,000 pounds by himself. I mean, if anybody could go it alone, I think it's Mr. Belgian Draft Horse. He's doing okay at pulling some weight around. What's interesting, if you take that, that single Belgian horse, you pair him up with another Belgian horse, you get him harnessed up together. Together, you would almost think that the math would add up to where, okay, we got 8,000, we got another 8,000, well, 16,000 pounds would be their capacity. But their capacity goes beyond the 16,000. It actually gets up to between 20,000 to 24,000 pounds that they can pull together. So we doubled how many horses, but we tripled the output from 8,000 to 24,000. But then there's another layer even beyond that. If you take two horses... And, and they grow up together. They're trained together. They work together. In other words, they have relationship over time together. And you hook them up together to pull a load. Their capacity isn't 24,000 pounds. It's greater. In fact, together, they can pull between 30 to 32,000 pounds. Pounds. That's an 8,000 pound increase. Another Belgian horse's ability is added on. Why? Just from the connection of working together in relationship. It's synergy. And it's one of the mutual benefits that we gain when we're connected and we're working together. When we get plugged into a small group together and we're helping each other, we're working together to solve problems, to move forward. And what God has for us to do, the first thing is, is in our work. And some of us, if time is the thing that's most limiting us from getting connected and being a part of a small group, taking that next step, it might be maybe some of your busyness is because you're not connected. Maybe if you did less and got more connected and took that next step, your productivity actually could be higher. And you could actually gain more margin in your life. Our work, our work. The second thing is verse 10, Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 10. It says, if either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. The second word is Walk. Walk. If you fall down, one can help the other up, but if anyone falls and has no one to help them up, what is that? We walk more securely when we're together. Being connected helps us with our walk. Why? Because on the road of life, I mean, you know, there's going to be some, there's going to be some roadblocks there's going to be some rocks we could trip over. There's going to be some divots. There's going to be some potholes, things that, that we can hit. Because we've got weaknesses. We've got wounds. We've got blind spots. We're, we're growing. We're imperfect. And, and we need somebody to help steady the cart, so to speak. And sometimes to help us, we're wandering off the path. And we need someone to help us walk back on the track to tell us the truth about ourselves, to give us some, some feedback, to get, let's just get... Let's just watch out for this. I, I hit this before in my past. I just want you to be aware. I see you going this way. We need that in our lives. Think about this for a second. You have literally never seen yourself. You've seen pictures of you. You've seen videos of you. You've seen reflections of you. 
but you've never seen you. But literally everyone else that you've interacted with has. They know what it's like to be on the other side of you. And when you think about it from that context, to be quite frank, like, like we're the least qualified person to help ourselves. <laughs> And it's why we need people around us to help us with the walk, to walk securely. And by the way, not just your spouse. Like, I'm, I'm connected because I'm married. Don't put all that on them. They will thank God that you are connected outside of just them. You need the body of Christ, other parts. And it, and it reminds me of, of a story it's from a number of years ago. And it's not a part of this church. It's actually part of a ministry and church down in, in the Dallas area. I heard this story from a, a minister share about there was this man, he was in a small group with four other guys. And he, out of the blue, he got this just, this email that came in from this, this woman, didn't know her, but just this email, very uh, seductive, honestly pornographic, kind of a solicitation type of email that just came in out of nowhere. And he ended up, he was tempted, he, he responded to it, and over time, he basically fell in love with this woman. Got attached to her in his heart. And one day, he disappears. His wife doesn't know where he is. And so she goes, she finds the computer, she finds the emails, she finds pictures, different things, and she's able to connect the dots and she sees through their communication that he's going to meet with her and she's in Boston. So they live in Dallas, she's in Boston. And they're planning on getting together and doing who knows what together at that point. So she sees that, she goes to the four guys that her husband is in a small group with and tells them what's going on. And these four guys do something incredible. They take time off of work, all four of them, take time off of work, fly themselves to Boston to go help their friend. And so when they get there to Boston, of course, they still don't know where their friend is. And so they're praying and asking the Lord, help, help us to, to find him. And, and they walk into this fast food restaurant and sitting at the table is this man and this woman that he's been interacting with. And the guys walk in, they, they, they kind of surround him and they say, come on, man, it's, it's time to go home. And the guy, he, he breaks down. He just starts, starts crying. He gets emotional. And he stands up. And he walks out of that restaurant with those four guys. They fly back home to Dallas. And this man repents to his wife, severs that relationship, all ties and connection to that woman he had been interacting with. And, and long story, very much abbreviated, God restored that marriage of that man and his wife. All because... That man was connected to a group of four other men who said, I'm going to help you in your walk. That when you get off track and you can't even help yourself and you've fallen down and you need somebody to pick you up, we're there to help pick you up. And God wants that for you and for me. In the context of those relationships and those connections, he wants that for you. And he also wants to use you to be that. For somebody else. It helps us in our, in our walk, in our work, and in our walk. The third thing is verse 11 of Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Verse 11, it says, Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. They will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? The third word in if you haven't figured it out by now, we're going all starting with the letter W. And that's when you know it's a pastor thing, right? But the third word is the word warmth. Warmth. Because we all need the constant encouragement and care. We need encouragement. We need care. We need warmth when life gets cold. And I, I love this Story. Actually, it's two stories. This is from Pastor Rick Warren that I think so illustrates an extreme dichotomy between these two, these two extremes when it comes to warmth, encouragement, care for one another. 
And if you don't know, Pastor Rick Warren, author of Purpose Driven Life, basically one of the best-selling books of all time, pastors of church called Saddleback Church. But he tells the story about how there was a man in his church that had been coming for about a decade. And he, the man had some health issues while Pastor Rick was out of town. He was traveling, doing ministry. But this man had some serious health issues where he was basically near death. And he had been in the hospital for about two weeks when Pastor Rick came back in town. Somehow or another, he found out about this man being in the hospital and went to visit him. And when he gets and visits this man, this man is, is very bitter. He says, Pastor Rick, I have been in this hospital for two weeks. And no one from the church has come to visit me. And Pastor Rick looks at him and says, I'll just call him John. John, you know, I'm so sorry. But... Honestly, it is your fault. Which I'm, in my mind, I'm like, oh, like I wonder what his like, facial expression or, or whatever, or like, was he about to fight you? Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, that's a shot, right? That's pretty direct. He said, he said, honestly, it's your fault. You've been coming to this church for about 10 years. And I see you, you sit in the back, and, and, and no, if you're sitting in the back right now in any location, this, this doesn't have to be you, okay? So... <laughs> I'm not presuming this upon you. But you just sit, you sit in the back, you come in, you go out. You've made no effort to connect to anybody. You, you never, you didn't get connected to a small group. You didn't get involved in serving on a team. And, and you didn't really interact a whole lot. didn't seem like you put forth any effort. If you had been connected to a group, I promise you, there would have been some people from that group that would have come to visit you by now. Then on the other side of the equation, he tells the story of somebody, a man in the church, who was involved in a couple groups, actually, within the church. And he had some health issues, and he was in the hospital. Not quite as life-threatening, but he was in the hospital for some time. And he, Pastor Rick decides to go visit him. So he goes, visits the man. When he gets there, the nurse stops him and says, no, no, wait a minute, who are you coming to visit? He says, such and such. He says, how many pastors do you guys have at that church? He says, well, and he, and he tells her we have this many that are on staff. We have these teams of people, you know, that we call, you know, they're, they're not employed per se, but they're pastors, they're lay ministers, people of the church, and they do all this and gives her all that information. And he says, but, but I'm, I'm the pastor. I'm the lead pastor, founding pastor of, of, of the church. And she says, well, I don't care who you are. No more pastors are coming here and visiting this guy. And he's, and he's like insisting, no, no, you don't understand. Like I am like the pa- like head honcho pastor. Like, I am his, the pastor, like actual pastor. And, and, he, and she would not let him go and, and visit with this man, although later he actually did like sneak pastor later and, and get in and talk to the guy. But, but, but he found out from interacting with this man that seven people from the groups that he's connected to Came and visited him in the hospital. Seven. What is that? From the connection, what? There's the opportunity for that warmth and that encouragement. That, and when, we, when we need care, there's people that will be there. And I so feel for people that don't have that. They just kind of go to church and they're just surrounded by God's people but not connected to God's people. And when times get tough, there's nobody there. And they get mad and they, feel dis, they just feel disillusioned and so sad. And it's one thing if you've been coming for like maybe a year or less or whatever, but when you've been connected for a while and there's no, no connections, no steps, you just so feel for people that don't have that. But it doesn't have to be you. It doesn't have to be me. God wants us to experience the warmth of his body encouraging us and caring for us to move us forward. And the last one that we'll hit as we get toward the end of our time is in verse 12. God wants to do something for us when it comes to our work, when it comes to our walk, when it comes to warmth and encouragement, but also when it comes to number four, which is in verse 12. And it says, the one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. The fourth word is warfare. Warfare. We all need people who will fight through life with us. Warfare. I'm talking about 
praying together over the issues of life. Standing in faith together over the promises of God, that, but it looks like it's not going to come to pass. You need, you need a partner in faith to say, hey, let's lift up our head. Hey, I know you're feeling discouraged right now, but hey, we're, let's talk faith. Hey, this attack of the enemy is happening in your family right now, but let's get together. We're more than conquerors through Christ who loved us, and the word of God tells us that we resist the devil, and he must flee from us. So let's get together, and let's start putting words of faith out there. Let's start resisting the devil. Let's kick the devil's booty and make him eat it. We're coming over big. We're going to win. You need somebody to fight through life with you. Warfare. Because those, those hard times, like they're coming. These surprises, but they probably shouldn't. They're coming. You need somebody to fight through life with and believe the word of God. Pray for each other. And this past year, my, my wife, Sarah, led a, a faith life training group at our campus. And we went through, did that, they did that together. And the very last meeting, my, my wife was, uh, invited me to be a part of that because they were going to pray over every person within the faith life training group. And it's an awesome group to go through, living the life of faith and standing in faith and prayer and all the time. So much good stuff wrapped up within that. We were praying over everybody in that group. And as we... Did so one, uh, one of the, the women of the campus in, in the group, and again, we had different issues, health, physical health, different things. But she had issues with her kidneys, having kidney disease for a number of years. And we prayed over that. We spoke over that by Jesus' stripes. She's healed, spoke to those kidneys, be healed, be whole, be restored. Disease, you must go. In Jesus' name, we just prayed over her. And I found out a, a few weeks, maybe a month or so later, she came to me actually right before a service on, on a Sunday and said, Pastor Sean, I want to tell you a testimony. I mean, we prayed about this and this kidney disease. I went into my doctor. And that doctor told me we did some scans and, and we see and, and this disease, those kidneys, it's not, we see no evidence of it. We're taking that disease off of your chart. You're, you're healed. Come on. Why? Because of being connected in a group of people who will fight through life together, speak the word of God together, pray for one another that we may be healed. Warfare together. I want to encourage you, don't wait until a crisis to get connected. Don't wait until you hit rock bottom to get connected. Don't wait till life slows down to get connected because time already goes so quick. And as the the saying, the proverb, well, proverb kind of goes, not proverb in the Bible, but just the saying. It says the, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. But the second best time is today, right now. Because connection takes time. I don't want to give you the illusion that you're going to join a small group like tomorrow. And it's just, oh, we're just best friends for life. And instant connection and everything. It might take a few groups. It might take, it might take some time. And it, it probably will, to find the fit, find the place where, okay, we're moving, we're pointing in the same direction. You know what? Every part in your body isn't designed to directly connect to one another. Your hand's not designed to connect to your foot. It's still in unity with the same body. And there'll be different parts that there's just a greater fit, and that's okay. And it can take time to find that. But the important thing to get over today is the value of it that I'm, I'm pointed in that direction. I'm seeking that out. Because it's part of the plan and purpose of God for my life. And so what's your next step today? It might be to join a small group. We have tables out there lobby, every campus, every location where you can investigate those, ask questions, get connected. Find a group with content that you connect with. Because so often we join a small group because of the content, but we stay because of the relationships that we build through it. So find content that you connect with. Go online. You can find it on the, on the small group finder. You can go out in the lobby. You can see those things there. But and we'll fully launch all those next weekend as the official rally day, but you can sign up for things now and even all throughout the year. The groups are always up live on the site that you can get connected to. But find that group. Maybe it's, you know, I need to get freedom from my past. That's the step that I need to take, which you know, I got habits, I got whatever I'm walking through, which is everybody. Go through freedom group. 
Maybe it's I want to get reaffirmed in the foundation of my faith. Go through the essential small group. Yeah, I need to be reminded of the love of God. I want that to be more set in my heart. Go through the unconditional small group. There's so many others, parenting, so many different things. But get connected to a group. And maybe you say, Pastor John, I can't find that thing that scratches the itch. I don't really connect. I always encourage you to consider something that oftentimes the gaps that we feel are the gaps that we're supposed to fill. The things that you say, well, I wish the church would, I wish that, well, why don't we have the gap that you feel? It's probably a gap that God might be dealing with you to fill. To step out and to lead that group that you wish you could join. You don't have to be perfect. We have training, all kinds of different things that can help you on that road. We can help you find curriculum. We can make it so easy that you just go press play, okay, and just care for people. Ask them questions. Check in with them. That's it. So simple. But get connected. Whatever your step might be. Let me pray over us. Father, I just thank you so much for your plans and purposes for each and every person at every location. Lord, you didn't make us to live alone. You said it wasn't good. Thank you that we've been adopted into the family of God. No matter what our family of origin is, if that's not our place of of warmth, of security and connection. But Father, we're part of a new family now. And I thank you that you connect us together as your body. With every joint, ligament, tendon. That those, Father God, are feeling stuck in disconnection or stuck in bad connection, stuck in, in, in these false connections that they've gotten caught up in, that we would turn from those and turn to you and turn to true connection with you and your people to experience that grace and that life flow. And as, as we do that, not only are we strengthened, not only is your body built up, but Father, that people would see the glory of God through our love for one another. With our heads bowed and eyes closed at every location, in this moment of prayer before the Lord, I want to give you an invitation to be connected, if you're not already, to the God who loves you unconditionally, who sent his son Jesus to die upon a cross to pay for the sins of all humanity that separated us from him. And he bore it for you and for me. And God rose him up from the dead and has given us this invitation to receive his perfect standing, to be made right in God's sight, not have to pay for our own sins because sin demands judgment. We either pay for it ourselves through eternal separation from God in a place called hell, or we receive that washing, that cleansing, that work of Christ on our behalf. This is not an invitation to become more religious. This is not an invitation to start going to church more often or become a better person or be more moral. That's wonderful. But if your morality and your steps of religious behavior, if all of that can make you right with God, God would have just sent those things, but he didn't. He sent himself. He sent his son. What have you done with him? Have you received Christ as Savior and Lord? You haven't gone too far. It's about his work, his goodness, not yours. He turns no one away. So if you're here at every location, you want to receive Jesus. We're all going to pray a prayer out loud together with you to receive him as Savior and as your Lord. But first I want to give you a chance by lifting up your hand on the count of three to acknowledge, because I just want to see and celebrate with you and the pastors at your campus the same, to celebrate. You're saying, I choose Jesus today on the count of three. If that's you, lift up your hand. One, two, three. Lift it up high. God bless you, I see it. God bless you, I see it. God bless you, I see it. God bless you. Put it right back down. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Hands everywhere. Your locations, I can't physically see you, but lift up the hand high if you haven't already. Put it right back down. We're so excited for you online. Put it in the chat. I choose Jesus today. We're so excited for you. Whole new life, whole new start, whole new family, whole new connection. And right now, whether you raise your hand or you should have, at every location, all of us together, pray this out loud, out of your heart, and mean it as you say it. Say, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. I believe he is the Son of God. He died on a cross for my sins, and he rose from the dead so I could have new life. Jesus, I confess you as my Savior and my Lord. 
I turn from my sin and I turn to you and I am now a child of God and heaven is my home in Jesus name amen amen come on let's celebrate at every location come on oh we're so so excited for you before we pray us out and Bless you as we go in just a moment. I just want to encourage you. One, if you just pray to receive Jesus as your Savior and Lord. Again, that's a whole new start. That's not just the, and I encourage you. One real simple thing is man, keep coming back. If you don't live in this area, we can, we can help you get connected to a church. It might be closer to you. That's fine. But get connected to a local body of believers. And get planted. Get involved. Serve. All that. Get connected. But also encourage you to tell somebody that you made that decision. Tell somebody that maybe invited you, brought you somebody you know here at, at the church online. You can put it in the chat. You gave your life to Christ. We'll, we'll help you. Get you connected to resources and next steps. Same here. You can talk to one of our prayer partners at, at the end. You can go out into our next steps area out to the right side of the lobby. There's a team of people there. They can answer questions for you, get a Bible for you, all kinds of different resources. You don't have to walk out feeling like, I, I think I just did something, and, and now, now what? Like, where do I go? What do I do? How do I walk this out? Let us come alongside you, serve you, help you, to whatever ability and that we, we can offer to you. But take that step. And I also encourage you out there in the lobby, as we mentioned before, there's a all the different information, whether you want to lead a group or get involved in a group, all that is out there in that lobby. And, of course, it's generally available all the time online at our myvfc.info website. There's places to sign up for groups, all that good stuff. Again, it's not about just getting involved in a program of the church. It's about being the church together and being connected.